Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Um, this is part six in the series, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about the session we had last night, which was kind of incredible. Um, I, I Another great one, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the prep I'll be doing for the next one, although I don't know what I'm really able to do because of how it went. So <laughs> I'll talk about that a bit. Um, so like the last time I had assumed or they had assumed that they were going to be spending the day in town. They had just um, killed Sorvia or, or destroyed the, the body of Sorvia. They'd staked her and they'd cut off her head. Very clearly vampire. Um, and uh, and I, had, I, I sent them a message over the week to retcon my description of her death. So she didn't decay. She just looked back to how she had been. And, like, um, and then they were all fine with that. I mean, you know, so it's never ideal to have to retcon something like that. But I, I just wanted to make sure that it was it fit the rules that I had been preparing for them because I want things to be sufficient. That's what I'll do today. Rules. Okay. Anyway, I'll come back to that. So they were um, basically in like lockdown mode. They were going around the town. Uh, that session was all about them getting everybody on board with just uh, holding out for the night. They brought Mary over to the Blood of the Vine. They brought Ismark and Irina to the Blood of the Vine. They went around. They got Doru there. They tried to get Vanya to stay, but he said he wouldn't. Uh, his uncle wouldn't let him. And so he went back to uh, build with Mercantile. Um, and they, they went through the town and tried to gather people. They only ended up getting like two families to come with them. Ismark was going door to door, like trying to get people. And I was describing how most people were turning him away. Most of the houses are empty by this point. But of the, of the handful of people who have remained, most people have turned him away or, or, you know, just didn't trust him enough to go to where he told them to go. So they were staying in their homes. So he, but he convinced everybody else, or these, these two families, to come to the Blood of the Vine. Uh, which is empty, right? Eric is gone, Sorby is dead, and so Alenka and Mirabel have also left. So really, it's just this big open <laughs> building in the middle of town um, where they thought, okay, we can hunker down here. Now, a couple sessions ago, they had been talking about this, and Pavel, or rather the character, the player who was playing Pavel, said, do we really want to, like, hang out in a public house? Like, we know these things have to be invited in, right? Isn't that the tradition? So isn't a public house, like, public? And he, they said, well, maybe we could take down, like, welcome signs or something like that. But they never did anything, and they just kind of didn't talk about that again. They just went forward with it. I was like, you know, are you sure you guys want to I wanted to say that. I didn't say anything because <laughs> I thought, man, this is going to be really dangerous because technically the vampires can just walk right in. It's a public house. They have been invited in by definition. And with Mirabel and Alenka gone, there's no one who owns it to refuse them entry or to revoke their invitation, which I'm going to say works. But then I thought, okay, wait a minute. Ismark is the Burgomaster. Right? Ismark is the Burgomaster, which means when push comes to shove, if things start to go bad, he can have a, revel a realization that he has authority over public places in this city. And then he can forbid them entry or, or revoke their invitation. So I had that in my back pocket and I needed it because it, it, it came up, <laughs> let's just say. So they basically hunkered down there. Um, Irina went to look for a couple of her friends and she's, she's I'm playing her off as like very, very frustrated as you can imagine. She she had been intending to go find the killer of her father. And that's what she was initially promised, is they would bury her father, and then they would go, and they would do this. And over the course of the day, after burying her father, it became clear that they had no intention of going to the Zerpool camp, going to Vistani, which she had been planning in the first place. And basically everyone said, no, sorry, you kind of got to stay here. And they pat her on the head, basically, and said, you know, sit down. You don't understand what's going on. And she's not a child, and she's she's furious about being treated as one. Ismark is treating her as a child. The, most of the party is, too. Um, and so she's just getting more and more frustrated with them. And so she, you know, kind of petulantly um, led them to this, this friend of hers who was still in town, or she thought was still in town. But when she got there, when they got there, the house wasn't abandoned, but the people weren't there. So they went in. And I described how all the holy symbols had been removed from the doorways, from the mantelpieces, any icon or holy symbol had, had been removed. And um, they, they were kind of confused about that. They're like, how long has this house been empty? And I said, well, since this morning, probably. They did some checks. And they're like, well, okay, it looks like people have been here this morning. Uh, they haven't packed up to leave. The house hasn't been like scavenged or looted. The two women who live here, um, um, Gosh, I forget the names that I gave them. But they were the two women who I had initially written up the random encounter for. If they were going to go to the Zerpool Falls, one of the uh, random encounters they could have were these two Barovian women sacrificing in the woods to the Lady of the Wood, the Baba Lusaga, although they don't call her that. They just call her the Lady of the Wood. 
And so I had these be those women. They had gone out to do it. And so as they're sacrificing to the Lady of the Wood, they've forsaken the old religion. Maybe it's not helping them in their view. It's not protecting them, but the Lady of the Wood might. That's the idea. So they went through the house and they found in, in the mother's room this idol. Like it kind of, I described it as almost like a, a, an Artemis figure. This, this, this woman kind of dancing um, with a sort of, you know, a, a nature motif around her. And, and it was set up in a prominent place in the mother's room. So it was like a, a religious symbol. And all the other religious symbols had been taken away, put in a box, and hidden in the closet, basically. And so they were like, uh-oh. And Irina vaguely recognized it. And she was like, yeah, I think this is like, I think this is like an old superstition. I think this is something that people out in Western Barovia sometimes do. By Kresik, there's some folk tales. There's some trees that are carved with this face um, of the lady in the wood. Yeah, I think there's something out there. I don't know. But these people aren't like that. And she was very confused. They waited around for a while. They didn't come back. They went back to the inn. So they spent all day preparing, basically. They boarded up the inn. They boarded up most of the windows on the first floor. On the second floor, um, left some of them open. Locked all the doors, locked all the windows they could, and posted up all together in the big common room. Night began to fall. Um, they went back to check on those two women. They weren't back yet. They came back and hunkered down. They set up watches and went to bed. Now, keep, this was about an hour and a half of play. It was, again, lots of role-playing. This is a very role-play heavy group. Lots and lots of conversations in character, out of character, about what to do, what's going on. Um, it's not, we don't keep it moving very rapidly. In fact, I, I kind of kept things moving because I wanted to get to this ending scene. I wanted to get through the night this time. I didn't want to end before that. So I several times kind of said, okay, what's where are you going again? What are you doing again? And what's going on? So um, I, I try to move things along because their tendency is to stay in character and role play and talk and discuss what they're going to do, which is great, super fun, and I love watching it. But I wanted to get through this night, so I kind of pushed it on along a little bit. I think they were okay with it, but um, their tendency is just to kind of sit and talk. So um, we got to that night, and I described how around maybe 11 o'clock or so, the fog started to get thicker. And right before Vanya or Varya had gone to sleep, I described, I sent her a private message about how the fog was kind of licking under the door into the inn. And it looked like kind of a clawed hand that would sort of dissipate and come in and like was clawing out at the door or something like that. So she was really creeped out. Uh, and then she went to bed. And uh, the priest, Ulysses, and the thief, Arthur, were taking the first watch. And they were going to stay up until like 1 in the morning or 2 in the morning, basically. Um, let most people sleep. And then they were going to go to sleep. And everyone else was going to stay up for the rest of the night. And then they were going to get up around you know, sunrise. It was the idea. But around 11 o'clock or so, Arthur goes up to the second story of the house to keep a better eye on things. And I describe how he sees this humanoid figure, but crawling like a spider with these really spider-like movements down from the church through the fog in the moonlight. Um, crawling towards the uh, the house. And I could describe how he was wearing this sort of like maybe white robe or something like that. Well, it was Father Donovich in his priest's garments, but he didn't know that at the time. I mean, he, he figured it was, but he was like, oh, goodness. So he saw this thing crawling closer. And uh, he also saw across the market, he saw uh, Dr. Maxim's house. Now, Dr. Maxim had gone missing that afternoon. No one had kept an eye on him. They had let him be, and he had run off. And in my mind, I think he ran off to... Um, I think he ran off to uh, to just try to get away. Maybe he ran off towards the uh, the ruin uh, up on the hill from the Ravenloft. Regardless, he was back by about eleven o'clock at night because they saw light, uh, a fire uh, light up in his house, like a candle or something. And then I described how some other figure in this white garment steps up to his front door, and uh, just from a distance you can't really tell, but the door opens and this figure steps in to the house, and then the door closes. So. There was this creepy crawling thing towards the tavern, and then there was someone in Dr. Maxim's across the way along with Dr. Maxim. Now, I know that I had prepared this sort of battle, and actually, if you look down here, I have this whole thing. I have the cultists with six thugs, Luvash, as well as the vampires and vampire swamp. But I, I realized something as I was preparing this, that the cult attack is, is premature, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it, it really changes the tone of the campaign. So far, it's been dungeon, it's not dungeon crawling, it's been very, very um, quick, um, extraordinary, uneven combats. 
uh, terrifying moments. It hasn't been like D&D &D battles with henchmen and, and bosses and things like that. And I thought that if they were attacked by a bunch of thugs with a cultist, it's going to feel way more like standard D&D. &D. So I wanted to do away with that. If they're still here the next night, then this will happen, and it'll probably be a lot bigger. I think I'll have a lot more um, cultists attack, maybe like 15, uh, because uh, they leveled up to level 3, and I think they can handle that now. Especially if they're inside with pistols and all these guys are attacking. Uh, you know, they got four hit points. A pistol will most likely kill them with a shot. So I'm not so worried about um, numbers. But anyway, that's getting ahead of myself. Um, I decided to instead have it just be Gertruda, Father Donovich, and Dr. Maxim. Because that, those are the three in town. Dr. Gertruda is coming to see what's going on. Father Donovich is already here. And Dr. Maxim has been completely taken over by her now at this point. Um, uh, having him, she's been charming him every night, and so basically I'm having it build up and build up, and he's sort of becoming like a Renfield kind of figure from Dracula, right? He's kind of losing his mind, he's kind of losing himself completely to her to her charm. So instead of having to do it every time now, it's going to be like he's going to have to be freed from it, as opposed to her having to do it again every night. I think at this point it's locked in. He's charmed by her. Um, so what happened was this figure started to crawl up to the door. Um, and it started to kind of, you know, knock on it a bit. And it was locked, and so all the windows were locked too. And so it climbed up the wall to the second story where Arthur was. And it just sort of like looked in the window right at him. Because the second story windows hadn't been boarded up. And it like tried to, you know, like point to the lock. And then it tried to like open the locked window. And he was like rushing up to the window and like trying to hold it closed. And it just burst through the glass right at it. And the idea was, they thought, okay, well it can't enter because we haven't invited it. So it was this horrifying moment when it broke through and they were all like, oh, it can come in? And, uh, and so there was a brief battle where this thing, um, Arthur had thrown a coin down the stairs to try to alert people downstairs because he didn't want to yell. Um, so he threw a coin down the stairs and so uh, Ulysses, the priest, had run up. And as he run and ran into the room, the thing burst through the window onto Arthur. And so I rolled initiative, and they, they rolled a tied initiative for the first round. And so Arthur scrambled away as the thing tried to bite at him. And Ulysses tried to turn undead. He didn't. He cast the spell, but the thing saved it safe, so it didn't work on him. He didn't lose the spell, but it didn't work on him. And so then I had a, a dex check to see who acted first, and Arthur acted before the creature. So he managed to scramble back as the creature tried to bite him. Then it was next nice, round two, and the creature went first, and it leapt onto Ulysses and bit him. And it rolled like a 19 for its bite. But it did one damage, and then it did one con damage. So it was like minimum. <laughs> and they were like, okay, okay, I think that's okay. And then I said, it attacks, it bites you again. And they were like, oh, this thing has multi-attack? Because it's a um, feral vampire, it gets two attacks. And it missed the second one. It missed the second one. But it got that first bite off, and so it hit, did one point of damage, and it drained a con from him and they were like we are in trouble and then it was their turn and he turned undead and this time he succeeded it didn't destroy it but he turned it and so it leapt out the window basically back out the way it came arthur swiped his dagger at it but missed but then when they ran to the window to shoot him they saw another figure standing by the uh the front and it was gertrude of this picture i have of gertrude i think it's really creepy it's perfect for what i'm imagining her so it's right here um there's this picture of gertrude or this is what i showed them and they were like, that's really creepy. <laughs> and it described how she was standing there just kind of staring up at them in the open window. And Dr. Maxim was right next to her. So they fired at uh, the, uh, the creature, Father Donovich, as he was crawling away. And I, it was very clear that he was you know, wild and kind of feral, snarling and howling and, and crawling. And she was walking. So they're a different sort of vampire. It's very made very clear. Um, they shot him and Arthur rolled a crit. He got a natural 20. And I described how the bullet hits him and does nothing. And they were like, oh. Okay. So we are in huge trouble here. <laughs> now, Pavel, when he transforms into the beast, he uh, having him do ma uh, magic damage. And also um, Varya, when she uses her curse, I had the, magic, the damage that she does uh, becomes magic damage as well. So they both have ways of doing magic damage, but so far they're the only ones. Um... You, um, Ulysses has turn on dead, but Arthur has nothing, so he cannot hurt them, at least in his current state, which was terrifying because he's the thief. He's the one doing massive damage with his sneak attack or his backstab. Um, so he he's like, great, this is gonna be, we're, we're in huge trouble here, and so Gertruda walks up and I have her say and very sweetly, give us the book, 
and no one has to die. And at that point, Varya's kind of, or the player, <laughs> her mouth dropped and she was like, oh, they're here for the book? Because of course, that's what the cult wants, is the book. Now, I had, you know, of course, they also want Irina and Ismark, but uh, this was the offer, which is give us the book and no one else has to die. Now, Gertruda was basically toying with them because she, if they, if they were to open the house and give the book, she would have tried to kill them anyway. She was just being cruel. That's how I was playing it. But they, but at least later on, uh, the player with the book seriously had said she was seriously considering giving it. It was a serious consideration. And everyone else was like, no, no, you, I'm glad you didn't because that wouldn't have worked. That would have just given the, the book away and it would have been, you know, who knows what she still would have done. So anyway, she steps up to the house. She starts to bang on the door louder and louder and starts to break it a bit. By this point, everyone in the common room is awake. And, uh, Doru, I have Doru, because the players are freaking out. They're like, what do we do? We can't hurt this. We can't hurt her. She's going to kill us all. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't offer any solutions. So I think they were waiting for, you know, uh, something like, uh, something to happen. The players weren't really doing anything. They were waiting for something to happen. And Pavel, uh, I think, was waiting for her to break in so he could attack her. And Ulysses was waiting for her to break in so he could hear his turn on dead. But they were waiting. Um, and so... I don't know. I, I'm sort of torn about my decision to do this. On the one hand, it was super cinematic, and I think it worked, and a lot of the players liked it. One player, I think, was a little disappointed that the solution came from an NPC. But anyway, this is what I did. Doru said, I can't. I thought we had to invite them in. And, and someone, maybe one of the players said, you can't come in. We haven't invited you. And Gertrude said, this is a public place. I can come, I can enter when I, when I like, or something like that. Like I had her say that. And so then I, and they were like, oh, goodness, what have we done? We, we just stayed in a public place where, of course, they can get us. And then I had Ismark stand up and kind of declare in a loud, shaky, but, you know, commanding voice, as Burgomaster of Barovia, I forbid you access, I forbid you entrance, right? Um, I basically, I revoke your invitation. And it was quiet outside. And then Gertruda said, we'll be back, and, like, wandered off, walked off into the darkness taking Dr. Maxim with her. I had her kind of like trace her fingertips underneath his chin as she walked by him, and so he kind of followed her into the darkness away from the yet. And then I had her kind of singing songs, because Mary's there, singing these bedtime songs, these lullabies, and Mary started to freak out, and uh, then they calmed her down. And then I had her start to call for Doru and say, your father's out here, Doru. What are you doing? You know, she's tormenting them, basically. And Doru covered his ears and started praying, you know. Um... And then one of the players started singing, and, and Gertruda left. Because, of course, now that her invitation's been revoked, she can't enter, and Dr. Maxim can't get in there, um, and the other creature's been revoked, too, and turned. So they, they in their current state, current state, couldn't get in. Now, if she'd had a clear view of somebody, she could have charmed them, but the only person watching from the upper window was Arthur, and he rolled like a 20-something for his stealth check, or for his, for his high check, because he, um, he ran away from the window and then went to hide to look at through another window. So she couldn't see him. So really, she, she couldn't have charm anybody. There was nobody looking out at her. And uh, and uh, that she had her invitation had been revoked. So there was nothing she could do. And she was tormenting them, but that was it. And so she went back to Ravenloft to report to Rahadin. But they don't know where she went. She's just gone. Doctor or Father Donovich um, is back in the church where his uh, resting place is. So he's crawled back there. They don't know that either. They, they suspect that he's there. But they don't know. And then Father uh, Dr. Maxim has been taken back to Ravenloft. He's gone at this point. She took him with she took him with her back to Ravenloft. So that means uh, that's basically where we left off. Was the players made it through the night, the rest of the night uneventfully, uh, and I had them level up. Now I changed that because um, I was initially going to have the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 as uh, Shadow Dark does, right? Ten times your level uh, of experience needed, but. I realized that for what I had been planning, especially since I want to get kind of to more climax, I want to get to a bigger place by Halloween, um, I want to expedite their leveling up process a little bit. So I changed it to basically 15. So they basically, instead of increasing by 10, every level increases by 5 every level. So they need 10 experience points to get to level 2, 15 to get to level 3, 20 to get to level 4, etc. Instead of 10, 20, 30, 40. So it's, it's halved. Um, and I think that'll be better because one of the players was like, don't you worry that, aren't you worried that we're going to be leveled up too much? And I was like, I honestly think 
I'm, I'm right now I'm worried about the opposite, that you won't be leveled up enough. And, and honestly, levels don't give them that much. Now, now that they're level three, they all got a talent and, uh, and some spells. Um, like the beast just got a couple more hit points, his strength went up, and that's it. Um, Arthur got an additional uh, die for his sneak attacker's backstab and some more hit points. Um, but the two characters that really matter here are, um, I mean, in terms of what they got, are the, uh, the Cursed Knight and the Priest. The Priest got a level, a, a tier two spell, and he picked Smite. So now he has magic damage. He can do d6 magic damage, and that's key against Undead, right, which can only be damaged by magic damage. So he now has a way besides, um, so now three out of the four people in the party can hurt Undead. And she picked Eye Bite as the witch spell, because Cursed Knights get a witch spell level 3. I think she picked Eye Bite. So that now she can do a d4 magic damage uh, in near distance and cause the person not to see her until the end of their next turn. So she's really strong. It's only d4 damage, but it's d4 magic damage. So now, and, and in addition to that, she could always do magic damage. Not always, but she can call upon her curse to start doing magic damage in melee. So really, uh, they're, they at level 3 now, they can actually fight vampires. And werewolves. Um, now, it's still going to be tough, but they can actually do it. And that's, I think, pretty key. Um, so now we can actually have a big attack. Now we can actually have a big attack. Um, if they stay. If not, then we'll move on to the campaign. That's why I'm not quite sure what's going to happen next. They haven't discussed what they're going to do. Because they, their plans had consisted of keeping Matt and Mary alive through the night and making sure that everybody was safe through the night. And now they've seen Gertruda. They know that normal weapons don't hurt her or her companion. And they know that she can't enter the public house uh, because she has been forbidden by the Burgomaster for now, at least. But that's it. And so they were talking, well, uh, one of the players said, now I do want to go to the Vistani because they probably know the rules. They probably know how, what cr these creatures have to do, what they can't do, how they operate. So. I do want to go to them now. Uh, and so I think there's a good chance they're going to go to the Zerpool camp next. Um, but whether they come back to Barovia after that, I'm not sure. But I, I do want to keep this, this cult in play. So I think I'm going to just say, you know, like, what? Uh, 3d4 thugs? One half, uh, along with Luvash, Gertruda, Vampire Spawn. Um, plus the cultist. I think this is going to come next time, the next night, the cult's attack. So basically, I'm just going to move um, this, because this is gone. This is gone. Final day. Um, this is done. Uh, that's true. Uh, if Irene has been taken, it's marked. So Irene wasn't taken. So that's that. Final night, Mary rises to Feral Vampire. She's not dead. She lived. Uh, and uh, the cult attack. Um, so this is done because he's not coming back. Dr. Maxim is gone. The dead in the church attack, the wolves attack as well. Um, alongside the cult. So it's an all-out attack. So I'm going to have undead, 3-4 thugs, Luvash, um, 2d4 zombies, one uh, d4 ghouls and 3d4 wolves. Um, now, again, these are just rough numbers, but they are going to come to Barovia tonight, this big group. Um, and they are going to uh, mostly attack townsfolk, but uh, they are going to try to break into this place too, and it's going to be... Uh, you know, a, a bit of a fight if they want to try to resist. So if they're there, this is going to be intense, and I don't know if they'll... Well, again, we'll have more of what we were planning to do that night. So basically now they have a warning that it's coming. Um, this, the ghost behind the graveyard, fight Ravenloft for possession lasts all night as Rahadin raises the dead uh, spirits to bolster Rod's return. So I think that will happen in the middle of the attack. As the cult says, you know, they'll, they'll cheer and say that um, the master has 
has succeeded in the ritual or the master is, is returning or something like that, right? Um, those cultists still alive at that point will pause and call in one spooky voice the master returns now they still need the book they still need the book to bolster his return in its full and to extend his power beyond the borders and to find the perfect vessel for it but this will work here um, yeah I'll delete that the ghosts are the dead in the church tags along the cult, alongside the cult. The townsfolk who remain in town are killed or scattered. Are killed or scattered in the woods. And this is the cult's attack. So I, I think I'm done with Barovi if they stay. I know the Zerpool camp if they leave. Um, I've got a few minutes before I run out of time here. And I wanted to... Um, I wanted to... Um, oops. Uh, let's do new. I wanted to do um, vampire rules in. Actually, I don't need a new document. I'll just use Van Richten's. Um, the Van Richten's bestiary that I've developed here. I'll put it there. Uh, Van Richten's Barovian bestiary. And I'll go down all the way to the vampire section. And I will say rules for. Vampires in Barovia. All right, so the first rule. Um, they cannot enter a building if not invited. Invitations can be revoked by those with authority to do so. Owners, rulers, etc. If a higher ruler grants access, no lower ruler can change it. This is going to be important because I, I know that Vargas Velakovich is not a fan of Strahd, but Victor Velakovich is. He's part of the cult. And so Vargas' death is going to be key for their point. Victor will then proclaim, all of these servants are my servants or they are servants of the same Lord that I serve, and therefore I grant them access to any place in the valley, right? Or something like that. So it becomes this huge deal. <laughs> now suddenly they can enter any building without invitation, and that will make it very much more difficult. Um, okay, they cannot enter a building if not invited. Um, that's a big one. Um, what else? Uh, Things that are different than their than their than their stat block because I think the stat block is just fine for all of them. So, uh, what else is different? Um, they cannot enter building if not invited. Invitations cannot be, can be revoked by those authority to do so. That's a big one. Um, everything else I think actually just is in the chat box or chat box is in the uh, is in the stat block I should say. Um, must sleep in a coffin daily, lose 2d6 hit points, they can't be healed until resting in coffin, takes 3d6 damage, 3d8 damage each round while in direct sunlight, cannot be killed unless pierced through the heart with a wooden stake while at zero hit points. Um, so actually, what else do I need? Um, those charmed by a vampire for seven days must make a wisdom DC 20 check or be permanently charmed by the vampire. For seven days in total, in a row. So that's what's happened to Dr. Maxim. Um, vampires retain the memory of those they were, but the lesser vampires are bestial and can only speak in broken words and can barely think 
through their bloodlust. That's something. Um, vampires cannot be harmed by running water. disturbed by garlic. When they are slain, they retain, they return to the state they were in before changing. Engaging group with authority to do so, owners, rulers, etc. of higher ruler grants access, no ruler, ruler can change it. Um, magical sunlight has no effect on true vampires, though vampire spawn are still harmed by it. Um, and let's see, um, I think that's it, I think that's it, uh, the vampire spawner still harmed by it. If I think about the rules, I'll add them in. So this is pretty much it, um, this is all I need to do, <laughs> um, because I think I have the rules now, so if they go to the Vistani, they can learn them. Between this and these abilities here in the stat blocks, I can explain what vampires are like. Um, and then they can go to um, the Vistani if they do, Velaki if they do, and uh, or stay in Barovia. And I know what's going to happen there if they stay. So that's it. All right. Well, I think that's it for this video. I hope it's been interesting, guys. I'll let you know uh, how it goes as we keep going in the campaign. See you all later.